R. Myers, Atlantic Monthly contributing editor, takes an in-depth look at North Korean society and the domestic propaganda to which its citizens are exposed. The World Affairs Council of Northern California hosts the hour-long event. It's kind of a miracle that I'm here because uh, I was in Washington, D.C. a couple days ago and uh, my publisher said, why don't you try to outrun the storm by heading north to New York? And, and I thought, I don't think so. So I, I drove south instead and I went to Richmond and got the plane out of there. Um, you know, I live in Pusan, which is uh, a, a harbor town on the south coast of South Korea. And I never see snow there and I was really looking forward to seeing it this time. But I don't care if I never see any snow again at this stage. Um, okay, what can you hear about North Korea that you haven't heard uh, a thousand times before? Really only the most important thing, which is what do the North Koreans think and how do they see themselves in the world around them? Uh, I'd like to start with an analogy. Let's imagine that uh, the house next door to where you live has been empty for some time and finally uh, somebody has come to move into it and you look out your window and you see them unloading uh, assault weapons you know, I don't know, grenade launchers as well, bazookas, you name it. Now, this is America, so it's probably all perfectly legal. <laughs> but as you lie awake at night, having put your house on the market, <clears throat> you're probably asking yourself certain things. And I don't think you're asking yourself what kind of cognac that man drinks or who's going to inherit the house after he dies. And I don't think you're all that interested in how many calories his kids are getting every day. You're probably more interested in what he thinks, uh, how he sees himself, what he's teaching his kids. And this is why I find it so baffling that in the United States, although we fought one war uh, with the North Koreans, losing 54,000 people in the process, and although we came very close to fighting another war in 1993 and 1994, uh, and although we've been locked in this increasingly dangerous nuclear standoff with the North Koreans, we still are not interested in what ideology they have and why they're doing all this. And in the meantime, impulsively accumulating hard facts, and then we wonder why we still don't understand this country. It, it's almost as if uh, we didn't know that Iran was an Islamic country. It really wouldn't matter how much intelligence we were able to gather about Iran. Its behavior would still baffle us. And this is the problem that we have in North Korea. And this is why today I'd like to talk to you about uh, North Korean ideology. I realize that sounds like a kind of dull topic. So I've, I've, I've chosen the parts of my book that I think uh, lend themselves more to a visual presentation like this. Uh, there is uh, some heavier stuff in the book as well. Um, but uh, I, I thought I'd keep it out of the talk today. Uh, ideology is especially important because this regime and this man that you see here in this picture uh, enjoy a much higher degree of mass support than we tend to assume. Uh, we tend to think of North Korea as a country that's in a sort of permanent lockdown uh, that survives purely by dint of its repressiveness alone. And that's just not the case. And uh, I think the evidence for this lies in the North Korean border itself. Now on the left you have the East German border, which I remember very well. I was a student uh, in West Germany and I would go uh, to Berlin quite often on the train and we'd have to go through this border. Uh, and on the right you have the North Korean border. And you can see they're very different. This is of course the border to China and not the DMZ to South Korea. But still, um, it's a very easy border to cross. And a very interesting statistic is that 50% of those who do cross this border into China bribe their way back into the country. Uh, now, nobody tried to bribe their way back into the Soviet Union or in, back into East Germany. So I would warn you against taking the hyperbole of a lot of these uh, North Korean refugee NGOs seriously. They like to talk about the Underground Railroad that is helping uh, North Korean migrants to safety. Well, I don't know of any slaves bribing their way back onto the plantation. So we need to realize that this is a country that... Uh, that survives not by dint of repressiveness alone, but because it is able to inspire its people still. Uh, so that's what I want to talk to you today about, is how does it inspire its people. Uh, I want to stay in the here and now, but I, I, we need to go back into history a little bit. And I want to talk about Juche, because Juche is actually not the uh, main ideology in North Korea. Juche was a reaction to, the, to this man here, to the Chinese uh, personality cult, which began exploding in the mid-1960s. The North Koreans felt the need to match this cult claim for claim. So Mao Zedong claimed that he was a poet, of course, and he enjoyed quite a, a good deal of international renown for his poetry. So the North Korean personality cult suddenly remembered uh, plays which Kim Il-sung had allegedly written in his youth, of which no mention had been made uh, until then. 
Uh, Mao Zedong had the Long March, for which he was very famous, the, on which he'd led his troops. And the North Korean historian suddenly remembered the arduous march that Kim Il-sung had taken his troops on. Um, Mao Zedong had Maoism as a world-famous ideology, and this claim, of course, forced the North Koreans to come up with something that they called Juche thought. Now, this is kind of a dry topic. I've written a lot of academic papers about it, um, but uh, it doesn't really lend itself to a, to a talk like this. But I just want to give you an example of what this sham doctrine looks like, because it is a sham doctrine. It exists to be praised and not to be read. Uh, it exists really only to enable the claim that Kim Il-sung is a great ideologue. Uh, this is just an excerpt from it, a representative excerpt, I might add. Um, now, th I recognize this prose style because this is how I used to write uh, in college when I had a term paper due the next day. And I had to fill 10 pages and at the same time uh, make sure that the professor didn't actually read them. So I would just repeat things over and over again and make it as dull and stodgy as possible. And that's what you see in this so-called Juche thought. Um, now, the regime, when it actually has a message that it wants to put across, it can do this very well. These are the best propagandists in the world. This is the most ingenious propaganda apparatus in the world. And it knows that when it wants to get a message across, that's not the way to do it. This is the prose that they use to fill those book spines so that people can look at those book spines and say, our Kim Il-sung is just as great an ideologue uh, as Mao Zedong was. But uh, in North Korea, ideology is not so much... Um, learned from the leaders as learned about the leaders. In other words, what people are taught in so-called political study sessions are the fantasy biographies of the two Kims. It's not so much what the Kims said as what they did, in other words. Just one more interesting fact, the North Korean encyclopedia entry on the Juche Tower is twice as long as the entry on Juche Thought. And that really tells you all you need to know about Juche Thought, which I, I, I don't really want to talk more about today. Okay, now to go back a little bit into history, uh, I, I, do we have any Koreans here today? Are any Koreans? Yeah? You guys Koreans? Yeah? Okay. Um, now, if, if you live in Korea as I do, then you, you, you may well be a fan of these historical Korean TV dramas. And if you watch them, you will have people maybe a thousand years ago talking about the Korean nation or the Korean race, the Minjok. And uh, actually, the word minjok did not appear in the Korean language until the Japanese brought it to the Korean people. And as Professor Carter Eckert of Harvard University has said, there was no strong sense of belonging to a Korean nation until very late in the 19th century. In other words, the Koreans were not nationalists. They were xenophobic, but there's a difference between xenophobia and nationalism. As you can see from this map, this is a Korean map from 1402, the Koreans at that time believed their country to be on the outskirts of this great Chinese uh, cultural realm. Uh, they, they saw themselves in a sort of permanent student position to the great Chinese teacher. So, in 1910, of course, Korea was annexed. Here you see the, the uh, Korean soldiers. And for the first few years of the uh, Japanese occupation of Korea, the Japanese ruled uh, their subjects so heavy-handedly that this nascent Korean nationalism uh, bubbled over into a big demonstration in 1919, which frightened the Japanese. And after that, the Japanese relaxed some of the uh, repressive policies that had inflamed the Koreans, and they decided to co-opt Korean nationalism instead of trying to stamp it out. And they did so in a very ingenious way. Uh, they did so with a campaign called uh, Naisen Itai in Japanese, or Nesan Ilche in Korean, which means Japan and Korea as one body. Now you see from that map on the left, uh, Japan and Korea both painted the same color on the school map. The message that the Japanese uh, spread in Korea was that you Koreans and we Japanese, we may have drifted apart over the millennia, but we are actually one people. We go back to the same divine progenitor Jimmu, we all have this uniquely pure racial bloodline, and this bloodline makes us uniquely pure, makes us also uniquely pure-hearted and morally superior to people uh, in other races. So, this is another um, postcard. This is a postcard from, from the period. On the right, you have Japan, and on the left, you have, um, have Korea in a three-legged race around the world. The legend says, let's cooperate together. Uh, now, is anybody here from Texas? You're from Texas. Great. Well, I, the reason I ask, is, I'm not losing my mind, the reason I ask is uh, I used to live in New Mexico and the Texans would come over in the summer to Ruidos and places like that and you'd see the bumper stickers 
would have uh, the, the flag of Texas and the United States flag, and the slogan was, Proud Texan, Proud American. And this is really the kind of attitude that the Japanese were aiming for in Korea. They wanted the Koreans to be proud of their Koreanness. They actually urged them to take pride in their history, in their culture, in their dialect. They didn't want to call it a language. But at the same time, they wanted them to be proud of belonging to this greater Yamato whole. And this idea actually went down much better than South Koreans today and North Koreans today would like to acknowledge. Uh, by the end of the 1920s, most educated Koreans uh, in big cities were voluntarily speaking Japanese in their own homes. They were cheering Japanese newsreels, which showed the victories over, uh, over the Chinese and so on. Of course, the average the average Korean at that time was uneducated, illiterate, he didn't have a radio. So those people had to be brutally coerced into complying with Japan's demands for prostitutes or soldiers or things like that. And I don't mean to downplay the brutality, but the middle and upper classes, which were deriving the benefits of this new order, they really subscribed to it uh, fully. So here you see those two groups. Um, there you have your, the average Korean peasant on the left, and on the right you have a very famous Korean dancer, I don't know if anybody knows who she is, Che Sung Hee, uh, who introduced the short tambal mori, the short hairstyle, to uh, Korean women in the 1930s. And you can see here that although she was a collaborator, although she donated enormous sums of money to the Japanese emperor, uh, to the imperial army, I'm sorry, uh, you can see from her child's Korean dress that she was still proud of her Koreanness at the same time. Okay, in 1945, as you know, the Korean Peninsula was divided, and there's a common misperception uh, in the West and in South Korea that while South Korea was ideologically tainted uh, by maintaining so many pro-Japanese uh, former collaborators, or chinilpa, uh, North Korea started out completely fresh. North Korea purged itself of all these former pro-Japanese collaborators and made a completely new start, and that's just not true. In fact, <coughs> North Korea was more welcoming of former intellectual collaborators than Seoul was. At least in Seoul, some of them went to prison, like Lee Gwang Soo or Chen Nam Sun. Uh, in North Korea, no former pro-Japanese intellectual collaborator ever went to prison. And in fact, these people, there you see uh, Che Sung Hee again, Kim, Kim Sa Ryang, Lee Gi Young, Song Young, these really egregious uh, pro-Japanese propagandists went to North Korea in 1945 and were welcomed with open arms and they took over leading positions in the cultural apparatus in North Korea. And this is significant because no kind of denazification process ever took place. They did not receive any kind of indoctrination in Marxism-Leninism because the Workers' Party itself did not know anything about Marxism-Leninism until about 1948. So in the meantime, these propagandists were expected to start <coughs> inspiring the people with, with, uh, with a love of the regime. And they did this quite naturally in the same way that they had been doing it under the Japanese. So basically, the Japanese ushered the Koreans into this uniquely pure race, and in 1945, the Koreans kicked the Japanese out of it, Koreanizing the Japanese symbols that they had learned during the colonial period. So that's it for the historical uh, part of my talk. I want to get into the present now with the worldview, and the worldview to which the North Koreans subscribe derives primarily from a race theory, uh, a racentheorie, as you would say in German, a, a, a notion of the race as being unique and superior to all other ones. So when I say they um, Koreanize the Japanese symbols, uh, <laughs> Japan had this sacred Mount Fuji, and the Koreans decided to <coughs> elevate Mount Pekdu, the highest peak in, on the Korean peninsula, to sacred status, which it had not enjoyed before 1945. Many South Koreans today wrongly think that they've always venerated Mount Pekdu. They only started this quite recently. Um, and Tangun, the emperor Tangun, um, the, who um, started the Korean race allegedly uh, thousands and thousands of years ago, he became a historical figure almost overnight. And there you see the same bloodline extending back thousands and thousands of years. The myth being that despite the numerous invasions which the peninsula endured over the centuries, uh, the Korean race was able to preserve its, uh, its pure bloodline, its unique homogeneity. And you can see that homogeneity uh, pictured uh, below. I wonder if anybody recognizes where that picture comes from. Anybody has been reading the news recently? It's from the uh, new North Korean currency. 
Um, and you can see from those faces, those people look like clones. And that really is kind of the message. Uh, because, according to the North Korean regime, the unique strength and unity of, of North Korea uh, derives from the homogeneity of the Korean race. And these mass games that I think you've all seen on TV, and maybe some of you have seen that documentary, A State of Mind, they're commonly misperceived in the West as Stalinist exercises in anti-individualism. We mistakenly think that the goal is to stamp out their sense of self, uh, to make them all uh, behave in the same way. And that's actually not the case. These mass games are very joyous celebrations of the racial homogeneity from which the strength of the race derives. Uh, the North Korean looks at these displays and sees thousands and thousands of girls of the same height, the same build, the same skin color, the same hairstyle, and feels a pride in the homogeneity of the race. The logic is a little bit funny for us, you know, to, to think that because a race is homogenous, it's uniquely pure. And this is kind of the logic. Because Koreans are, are all alike, they are much kinder to each other than than people in more heterogeneous nations. Here's another uh, interesting slogan from a North Korean magazine. I always say that North Korean propaganda is a bit like a fascist's idea of what communist propaganda should look like. Because you've got the uh, left-wing terminology being used uh, to put across uh, a, a race-based message, which is actually incompatible with Marxism-Leninism. I can't stress that often enough. This is not a nationalist-tinged Marxism like you had in Yugoslavia. This is uh, a way of looking at the world in almost exclusively racial categories. And, and nothing could be further removed uh, than Marx's basic uh, idea of workers of the world unite. Now, these aren't Nazis, mind you, okay? Uh, no claim is made to physical superiority, to being ubermenschen or anything like that. Rather, just like the Japanese before them in the colonial period, the Koreans claim a moral superiority. They claim that they're inherently better, purer, uh, more moral than people uh, in other countries. The difference to Japanese nationalism is this, where the Japanese believed that their virtue had protected them over the centuries, as you can see here in this uh, depiction of the divine winds which destroyed the Mongolian fleet. Korea, of course, had a very different history from Japan. Korea had been invaded very often. So the Koreans believed that their virtue had made them an easy prey over the centuries. They believed that they had been invaded so often and abused so often by foreign powers because they were just too good, uh, too kind to survive uh, in, in such evil uh, geopolitical surroundings. And of course, this way of this, this uh, in inclination to look at themselves as the children on the world stage uh, is tied together with the perceived need for a parental leader who will protect them and indulge them and allow them to be themselves without fear of invasion. So this brings us to the leader. And again, just to, just to make clear, the personality cult is not the basis of this worldview. The worldview comes out of, the Kim cult comes out of the worldview itself, logically, organically, so to speak. Uh, now this Kim cult is quite obviously derivative of the Hirohito cult uh, that was propagated in the 1920s and 1930s in Korea. I could give you lots of examples, but here's one that I can, I can show you uh, quite easily on a slide. There you have Hirohito pictured on his white horse, which was sort of the symbol of racial purity, uh, the, Japan, the Yamato race's uh, racial purity. And of course, Kim Il-sung was also shown on a white horse. And even the terminology is the same. Uh, both leaders were referred to as great marshal. And in Korean, the, the word was the same as well. This is striking to me that they didn't even feel the need to change the terminology. And of course, Kim Jong-il is also shown on a white horse, although the, as you can see, the sunglasses kind of ruin the effect a little bit. <laughs> but he's often uh, videotaped and, and, and pictured riding on white horses as well. Now, um, Stalinism is really another word for Marxism-Leninism. What is Marxism-Leninism? Well, Marx himself, Marx said that communism was inevitable. He said that capitalism was doomed to collapse no matter what. So the revolution was going to happen anyway. And Lenin came along and Lenin said, no, I don't think so, because the masses are not particularly intelligent. They're not particularly critical thinkers. So um, if they're left to their own devices, these workers will fall very easily into the trap of trade unions. 
into the trap of demanding wage increases and getting a little bit more every year from the capitalists. So in order to keep the masses uh, on message, so to speak, in order to keep the masses uh, fighting for the revolution, they need a communist party. Uh, and this idea is at the heart of, of culture under, under Stalin as well. The party's role is to make the spontaneous masses grow up, in other words, to instill revolutionary consciousness into them. And that's why Stalin and the Communist Party in the Soviet Union were always depicted as fatherly teacher figures. And uh, as you can see from this picture, what do you think is the focal point here in the picture? What part of Stalin's face are you supposed to be looking at? The eyes, right, because the eyes are the symbol of, of his unique mastery of dialectical materialism, this supposedly omnipotent science which was going to, you know, transform the world. Whereas, the eyes, whereas in Korea, in North Korea, the belief was and is that the Korean people should remain naive. It's only logical, really, if you're born pure, if you're born better than everybody else. It follows that you don't really need to be tempering your instincts with book learning. That way you'll only dilute them. So it's better for the people to, tra to stay true to their pure instincts, for which reason uh, Kim Il-sung and the Workers' Party are not fatherly teacher figures. Instead, they're maternal uh, protector figures. And uh, as you can see here from this picture, the focus is not on Kim Il-sung's eyes, which, which you can't really make out very well in this picture. The focus is on his, his bosom, or his pum, to use the Korean word. If you read uh, North Korean poetry, uh, the poets are often talking about the desire to rest their faces against this expansive chest and be enveloped in, in the parental leader's embrace. Here's another uh, example. This is what Stalin does at night. You know, he, he gets ready to teach the people the next day. And that's what Kim Il-sung does late at night. Um, I, I showed this slide to one of my classes in South Korea, and a kid at the back of the class said, maybe he's taking the coat off. <laughs> but, um, but he's not. Uh, what do you find a lot of in North Korean studies, because unfortunately very few people in North Korean studies, or these people at these North Korea think tanks in Washington, D.C., can actually read Korean. I'm not saying my Korean is, is any great shakes, but um, I find it very odd that you could be at a think tank uh, pulling down a huge salary for, for expertise on North Korea and not be able to read uh, the Korean language. I mean, imagine being at a, an Italy think tank, say, and you, you, you can't read Italian. I don't think uh, that would be acceptable. Anyway, one of the mistranslations that you find so often in, in writing on North Korea is this phrase, father leader. Actually, the word, oh boy, I will ask the Koreans present, that doesn't mean father, does it? Oh boy, nal. Uh, in, in, in Korea is not Father's Day, it's Parents' Day, okay? So Kim Il-sung is not referred to as the father leader, he's referred to as the parent leader. And that's quite odd, isn't it? If you're referring to a man, not as a father but as a parent, it's quite obvious that you're actually trying to play up his maternal side, and that's exactly what they do in North Korea. Kim Jong-il himself is on record as saying that Kim Il-sung's motherly qualities were the key to his success. So. Um, when people tell you that North Korea is a Confucian patriarchy, they, they really couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, this is not a Confucian society at all. Kim Jong-il as well, um, even when he's depicted in military uniform, he comes across more as a sort of Salvation Army matron. Uh, he, he looks very feminine. Uh, and in photographs, he looks like a, like a South Korean housewife or an ajuma. Um, <laughs> And here, of course, you have him with, the, with his expansive uh, breast as well that soldiers want to lay their faces against. And, and um, we tend to think that this personality cult is so absurd because he doesn't look like our idea of a general. You say general to an American and we think MacArthur and Eisenhower, we think people don't look at all like this. But actually, this image exerts a strong psychological appeal uh, on the people of North Korea. Now, just to make clear that I'm not actually reading anything into these pictures, because North Korean propaganda is not subtle. When they want to make a point, they come across, they come right out and say it. So they do say, literally, Kim Jong-il Chang-gun-nim, our great mother, General Kim Jong-il. Okay. That's not all they call him, of course. They do call him on occasion uh, father leader as well. But he's also being referred to as the parent increasingly. And always his maternal qualities are at the forefront. Uh, he's always described as traveling around military bases, worrying about whether the soldiers are warm enough, whether they're eating enough, and so on. He's not an educating figure. The party is also referred to quite literally as the mother party. 
And this is the attitude that is expected of North Korean citizens. Um, I cry out forever in the voice of a child, mother, I can't live without mother. Okay. One of the signs that's often held up during parades is we cannot live away from his breast, him being Kim Jong-il. So the symbolism really could not be more explicit. So here's pretty much the cosmology. At the top you have the motherland, the Omoni Choguk, not the fatherland. Then you've got the mother general, then you've got the mother party, and then you've got this child race underneath it. Now if you were to show this slide to a social psychologist, even to somebody who had no idea about North Korea, he would say, well, I see an absence of father symbols, I see an absence of a father principle, I see only mother uh, authority figures, I would expect this to be a country uh, which behaves very spontaneously and instinctively on the world stage. And that is, of course, what we see with North Korea. We see this pattern of events from the Panmunjom axe murders in 1976, when uh, the North Koreans just wrested axes from American soldiers and hacked them down. Um, the Rangoon bombing in 1983, uh, in which the North Koreans alienated one of their few remaining friends on the world stage, uh, the Burmese. And then this uh, uh, bombing of the Korean airliner, South Korean airliner in 1987, the year before the Olympic Games. All this kind of behavior, which really is nothing at all like the sort of behavior that we experienced from our Cold War adversaries, can only be understood in the context of this race-based ideology, which stresses the need to follow uh, the instincts of the Korean people. The outside world, if we can talk about this for a bit, because there's a misperception among a lot of people that the uh, North Koreans only hate the Americans that they only distrust the Americans. That's not true. Because if you believe your race to be uniquely pure, it follows from that that all other races are inferior to you. And this is the message that they get across. They get it across a little bit more subtly than, than other things. If you can look at this picture, unfortunately it's in black and white, but I think you can still make it out quite well. This is a depiction of the 1989 Youth Games in Pyongyang. Uh, in other words, these are friendly foreigners who have visited Pyongyang and are cheering this fantastic city that they're looking at, the first thing that strikes you is there's only one Korean in that crowd, namely the guide. So the, in other words, the, the cleanest race has to be kept apart from these foreigners lest they be defiled. The other thing that strikes you is that, um, say, the dress of the people, you have those two African uh, women and the, the uh, Caucasian woman in the foreground, they are dressed in ways which, which even today in, in North Korea are considered very indecent. You have these two uh, blonde women in the foreground. They look to us normal and attractive, but in North Korea, wearing your hair like that is considered slovenly. It's considered a sign of bad morals. The other interesting thing is that no matter which direction the foreigners are looking at, their faces are partially obscured by this sort of menacing shadow. The only person in the crowd whose face is evenly lit, who is attractive by Korean standards, is the only <coughs> Korean person in that crowd. But of course, the Americans... Are, are the real villains in North Korean propaganda. Kim Jong-il has been quoted as saying, just as a jackal cannot become a lamb, the Yankees cannot change their savage nature. Now, you couldn't get a less Marxist idea than that. Uh, the Soviets were always very careful to draw a distinction between uh, American capitalists and American proletarians, between white Americans and black Americans, between, uh, even between men and between uh, American women and children when they were talking about uh, uh, military topics, for example. You don't see any of this in North Korea. All Americans are inherently degenerate um, due to their race, according to the North Koreans. This is one of the ways in which they get it across. The interesting thing about this is that although they have Caucasian facial features, they have black skins, and I think that this is uh, because North Korea does not want to alienate its few remaining friends in the world, most of whom are in Africa, like Zimbabwe. But at the same time, it wants to communicate the contaminated nature of American racial stock to its people. So you see depictions like this. Here's another one just to show you that they demonize women and children as well. This is a depiction of a uh, Korean woman uh, trying to confront the American missionary family which murdered her child. So you see the emphasis on Caucasian facial features, on what Koreans perceive to be sort of typically white faces. You have the, the big noses and the sunken eyes and so on. Here's the poster that I started off this slideshow with. Um, the, the legend reads, 100,000 times revenge on the Yankee vampires. And I, I put the, the year in which this poster appeared next to it because that was the year in which North Korea was America's main aid recipient in Asia. They were receiving uh, enormous sums of money from the United States at that time. And ironically enough, that was when they ramped up 
their anti-American propaganda. I think the, the, the implications of that are pretty clear, that they need this uh, enemy uh, figure in order to, to rally the people around the regime. And they take this stuff seriously. You know, I went to the uh, resettlement facility for North Korean refugees, which is in Gyeonggi province uh, in Seoul, and I was walking down the hallway um, and it was a bit like being in high school again because all the girls were sort of recoiling from me in horror. And I said to my guide, I said, you know, what's, what's going on here? And he said, um, yeah, you know, they've, they've been indoctrinated with anti-Americanism. And I managed to talk to one of the young girls uh, after I, I had done the rounds. And she said, yeah, you did a lot of bad things on the peninsula. And I expected her to say the carpet bombing of North Korea, which really was, I think, unconscionable. And which really did, I think, constitute a war crime. It was conducted with so much... Uh, indifference to North Korean civilian life, that I think this is something we as Americans need to come to terms with, regardless of how we think about North Korea. But the North Koreans, interestingly enough, don't talk about that very much, because it conflicts with the personality cult. Kim Il-sung could not have been a very protective motherly leader if he allowed the country to be completely flattened on his watch. So instead of that kind of thing, they focus on, on, on completely fictional outrages like this alleged murder of a Korean child by, uh, by American missionaries. And this girl that I talked to said, in response to my question, yes, you Americans did a lot of bad things. Once a Korean child stole a peach from an American missionary's orchard and she was murdered. Now, these seem like very trivial stories to us, but this is the kind of thing that they use to whip up anti-Americanism in North Korea. And far from showing any signs of fear of the United States in their propaganda, they actually show these kind of wish-fulfilling posters of the uh, American capital being destroyed. So America is, is ridiculed as a kind of paper tiger uh, whose day will come. Now, just to talk about the military first policy, which is the uh, policy that uh, the North Korean regime is now propagating. Here's a picture of uh, North Korea right after Kim Il-sung died in July 1994. You see the weeping North Koreans looking to Kim Jong-il for salvation, so to speak. Um, now, Look at the skies, you have these gray skies, which are a symbol of the changing times uh, on the world stage. In other words, Kim Jong-il inherited uh, a situation that was much more difficult than his father had. This was the message that the propaganda apparatus put across, because they knew, with a famine coming, they could see this famine on the horizon, they knew they could not present Kim Jong-il as a kind of all-round uh, figure who was just as good at economic matters as at military matters. They knew that they had to disassociate him from the whole economic problems as quickly as possible. And they did this through the military first policy. The message of which was basically uh, Kim Jong-il saying to his people, you know, guys, I'd like to keep feeding you, but the threat from the United States has never been greater than it is now. So I'm going to be traveling around the country visiting military bases 24-7. In the meantime, you've just got to feed yourselves. Uh, this is interesting because this was not proclaimed after George Bush's Axis of Evil speech, as many people wrongly think. This was proclaimed in January 1995, which was weeks after the agreed framework had been signed between the Clinton administration and Kim Jong-il, uh, weeks after uh, Bill Clinton had sent a kind of groveling letter uh, to Kim Jong-il promising full compliance with this treaty, and weeks after American aid had begun uh, coming into the country. In other words, this military first policy was not a response to a perceived increase in the threat from the United States. It was a response to the economic crisis. It was their only way of getting out of this economic crisis. And it actually worked for them. It got them through it very well. Even today, many North Korean refugees believe that the famine was America's fault. The problem is this, where Kim Il-sung's legitimacy as a leader had rested on two pillars, namely economic success and military strength, Kim Jong-il's legitimacy as a leader rests exclusively on military strength, on that one pillar. And this is the problem, really, at the heart of this nuclear standoff that we're in right now. We're basically trying to persuade Kim Jong-il to climb down from this pillar without offering him any, any other place to go. I'll get back to that a little bit later. Now, this is how the North Korean propaganda apparatus tries to, pick, tries to present South Korea to the North Korean people. The North Koreans now know that South Koreans are richer. They know this because the information cordon that once isolated North Korea from the rest of the world is in ruins. 
So many North Koreans now have access to South Korean DVDs. Some of them are even watching South Korean TV if they live in the south of North Korea. Some of them are watching Chinese TV. So the government cannot persist in this ludicrous lie that all the South Koreans are starving to death. So the North Korean regime says, yes, they are better off than we are. And here you can see them uh, with their cameras and their motorcycles and so on and their nice cars. But for all their material wealth, the South Korean people are still deeply ashamed of living under the Yankee yoke and they long to uh, rest their faces in, in Kim Jong-il's bosom as well. So here you see them, South Koreans, cheering this image of Kim Jong-il on a screen. And this was the message that the North Koreans were putting across throughout South Korea's sunshine policy, which was a kind of accommodationist policy uh, in, during which the South Koreans were trying to, to bribe the North Koreans into behaving, into behaving better. Um, this message worked pretty well for a while when you had left-wing governments in power in uh, South Korea which were doing their best to help the North Korean government keep face. Uh, they were doing their best to avoid provoking North Korea. They didn't criticize North Korea too strongly. The problem really began in 2007 with the election of Lee Myung-bak uh, to the presidency in South Korea because he was the anti-Pyongyang candidate and he won pretty, pretty easily. So, obviously, that reality of Lee Myung-bak's election was in direct conflict with the image of South Korea which the North Korean regime had been trying to present to its people. And, and the propaganda apparatus was so stunned by this election that they didn't even know what to say about it for the first few months. They just didn't mention it. And then, um, in 2008, you had mass South Korean protests against the import of American beef. And uh, South Koreans from all walks of life took to the streets with signs denouncing Lee Myung-bak as a traitor and denouncing the Americans for trying to poison South Korean children with their diseased beef. And, and these protests could not have come at a better time for North Korea because they really played into the new propaganda line, which was that Lee Myung-bak had kept his intentions secret from the electorate. But of course, those beef protests fizzled out. And that's when North Korea resorted to that string of military and nuclear provocations that we saw in the first half of last year. Because this country really has nothing else with which to inspire its people with pride than shows of military or nuclear strength. I just want to say something about the succession. We now know pretty well who the next leader is going to be. It's going to be one of Kim Jong-il's sons called Kim Jong-un. Unfortunately, we don't know very much about him except that he was allegedly educated in Switzerland. But it's not really important who the guy is. The important thing is what kind of a leader he is already being celebrated as. Um, my hope was that this new leader was going to be presented as a kind of uh, new leader, maybe a, an economy first kind of leader. And that isn't happening. He's being presented as a young general. And added to that, North Korea has enshrined the military first principle in the Constitution. It's deleted the word communism from the Constitution as well. So this regime is looking at this military first paradigm for the long haul, in other words. So to return to this graph, it's not really important whether the next leader is Kim Jong-nam, or whether it's Kim Jong-chol, or whether it's Kim Jong-un, or whether it's uh, Kim Jong-il's brother-in-law, Chang sung tae because whoever takes over is going to be faced with this same quandary, really which is, how do we go from being a military first country to, say, an economy first country without losing all reason to exist as a separate state? And this is why it's so unrealistic for us to expect them to trade military strength for a mere aid deal. Let's say we increase their standard of living by 20% over the next five years, which would be an awful lot. That would not help Kim Jong-il politically because North Korea would still be hopelessly behind South Korea in economic uh, aspects. And therefore, North Korea would have no reason to exist as a separate Korean state. All that it has now, its only source of legitimacy, is the claim that it alone is standing up to the Yankee enemy, the race enemy. So, to people who, who are optimistic about the, the six-party talks or the bilateral talks or which, whichever talks are supposed to take place, I ask the question, where does North Korea go if it disarms? What does it do with itself? How does it justify its existence? And none of the optimists who I've talked to has been able to give me an answer. And uh, they may not consider this a big problem, but we can be pretty sure that Kim Jong-il realizes just how big a problem it is. 
and this is why I'm so pessimistic about the prospects for, for arms talks, because you can, you can talk a regime into doing a lot of things, but one thing you can't make it do is commit political suicide. And this is where the left wing and the right wing and the center in America are all wrong about North Korea. The left wing is wrong because you cannot bribe or sweet talk a country into committing political suicide. The right wing is wrong because you can't bully it into doing that either. The center is wrong for thinking that you can get the Chinese to persuade them to do it. <laughs> so what is the way out? I'm not really sure myself. Um, I think if I were to propose any way out, it would be for us to, uh, to shift our diplomatic energy and resources from this uh, very fruitless negotiation process, which really just buys time for Kim Jong-il's nuclear program, to the Chinese, not in order to persuade the Chinese to, to uh, work on the North Koreans, but in order to persuade the Chinese to allow North Korea to collapse. Now, that wouldn't be an easy job, I think. It would be quite a hard sell because, A, the Chinese don't want American troops standing on the Yalu River, and B, they don't want to lose all those really favorable uh, economic deals that they've concluded with the North Koreans, whereby they extract North Koreans' minerals at, at very good prices. But, you know, the example of German unification gives us some ideas. One of the things that we said to Gorbachev to get him to sign off on German unification was we promised not to station American troops east of the Elbe. Perhaps a promise not to station American troops north of the Han River might bring us something with the Chinese. I don't know. But the Chinese are rational people. And as difficult as it might be to, to talk to them about North Korea, at least there's some prospect of success, which is more than can be said for what we're doing right now, which, as I said, is trying to get North Korea to, to commit political suicide. Well, that's it from me now. Sorry it took a while. Thank you. So, Sarah. Brian, thank you very, very thank much. You. That was uh, enlightening and uh, uh, entertaining, if that's the right word. I mean, to see the pictures to your talk, I found that very, very interesting. Um, I have uh, several questions from the audience, and I'll invite uh, your questions uh, to come up as we're starting the dialogue here. We have a few minutes left, and we'll go a little bit longer if, Brian, you'll indulge us. One question that occurred to me and also occurred to one of our uh, members of the audience was when you're describing this um, historical line from the Japanese um, colonial period and Korea, uh, you talk about the Koreans and that would be North and South Koreans and then you're describing the um, uh, culture and the uh, thought that inspires the, the North Korean culture. How do you distinguish North Korea from South Koreans there? Uh, in terms of nationalism, there, there is a good deal of agreement. I think uh, if you talk to South Koreans today, you will find a general consensus that uh, because the Korean people uh, are, are perhaps not as cunning or, or perhaps not as rapacious as other nations, that they suffered unduly throughout history. And there is still in South Korea, among a lot of people, uh, not among the younger people so much, but among the older generations, a certain pride in the homogeneity of the Korean race. And, and women who choose to marry outside the race will, will uh, meet quite stiff opposition. But things are changing in South Korea, for one thing. And this myth of, of, of uh, this pure nation is not believed quite as literally or, or as fervently as it is in North Korea. Mm -hmm. So things are, are changing in South Korea, whereas in North Korea it's really sort of an ossified uh, race-based nationalism. But how does the South Korean look at his or her North Korean counterpart? Well, South Koreans don't want reunification, basically. They're not interested in that. And yet, at the same time, they feel quite guilty about it. Uh, and one of the ways in which they assuage their own guilt about this is to believe that North Korea is, is simply on an earlier stage of development. Um, than South Korea is. So many, many South Koreans, when you go on a tour bus to North Korea, as I did two years ago, they will look around them at, at all this misery, really, and try to shrug it off by saying, well, it's like South Korea was under Park Chung-hee. This is how South Korea was in the 1970s. There's really not a very high awareness of North Korea among South Koreans. There's not very much interest in North Korea. When I give classes um, on, on North Korean matters at my university, most of the students tend to be foreigners. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, one question from the audience: uh, 
if somebody has left the North Korean regime and decides he or she wants to go back for whatever reason, are there barriers to entry? Are there punishments that that person expects to... Well, there are evidently bar barriers that they wouldn't have to bribe their way back in. But on the other hand, I cannot believe that they're voluntary. So many of them are voluntarily returning to the country if they know that they're going to be punished. So the question that, that in my mind is um, either the regime knows that they were gone for two years and it doesn't care, or it doesn't know they were gone for a few years. Either way, really, is this a totalitarian state? I don't believe it is. Uh, we, we have no experience historically of people wanting to return to totalitarian states to the same degree that they are in North Korea. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the, the, if you look at things like the ratio of, of policemen to average citizens, it's lower than, than the ratio you'd find, say, in Chicago. So I don't believe uh, that this is a country, as I've said, that rules by repression alone. Uh, do North Koreans, in, in your experience, do North Koreans believe this propaganda? I think they do. Again, the evidence is in the kind of people who are leaving the country. I would, I would guess from my own experience and from what I've read that about 90% of the North Koreans who choose to escape that country are from the least propagandized, least educated sector of society. Um, the people who are more highly propagandized, the middle classes, the educated classes, the upper classes, they're not leaving. We're not seeing real uh, intellectual dissidents. We're not seeing real intellectual uh, emigrants from North Korea. And that points to me uh, to, to, to a proof that this regime is still being quite successful in inspiring its people. Uh, what we've learned from social psychology is that we all need to attribute some kind of significance to our lives. And the North Korean regime does this. Whether you're a bus driver in North Korea, whether you're working in the mines, or whether you're a soldier, the regime gives everybody a part to play in this racial mission to kick the Yankees out of the peninsula, to reunite the, the nation. Um, and, and this seems to me to be quite successful. It, it looks to me much more successful than the rival ideology in South Korea, which is a kind of orthodox consumerism, where you're supposed to earn as much money as you can and buy as many brand name products as you can. Uh, that's not working in South Korea, or you wouldn't have such high rates of suicide and, and depression among the people. And I think if you want to understand why the North Koreans aren't all rushing out of North Korea and trying to get to South Korea, uh, I think you need to understand that. But, but going back to North Korea for a moment, um, this um, belief in the ideology, isn't it colored by the fact that at least what we read here in the West, there's such widespread starvation and there's um, political repression and uh, uh, difficulties that are, that are quite insurmountable would be for, for many of us. But what, that, yeah. doesn't that color their view on this? Not really. Uh, for uh, dear leader? I think it, it's ironic, really, that, that in a way we think more like Marxists than the North Koreans do. Because for us, it's the economy stupid. We look at all politics and all political differences in economic terms. We even look at the, the rise of Islamism in, in economic terms. We think it comes from economic deprivation, despite the, the enormous wealth of, of the people who bankroll uh, Islamic terrorism. Um, another Im important thing to keep in mind um, is that nationalism uh, is as well suited to bad economic times as to good times. Mm -hmm. When things go well, you can say it's because of, of the race, because of its strengths. And when things go badly, you can blame them on, on, on people outside the country. So if this had been a Marxist-Leninist regime, it would never have survived that famine because Marxism-Leninism's uh, whole uh, reason for being was the promise to improve the material life of its citizens. But um, nationalism is not about that. Nationalism is about making few people feel proud for other reasons. And we know, say, from Nazi Germany or from Imperial Japan to nations that were going gangbusters right up to the very end, that people can put up with an awful lot of deprivation if they feel it's for the, for the well-being of the race. Uh, the media could play a, a role. What about the media in uh, North Korea? One question here, how pervasive is the Internet, if at all? Hey, the Internet is not pervasive at all. Um, they do allegedly have uh, Internet cafes that are, of course, closely monitored um, that some people can get into. There's a kind of intranet, apparently, uh, in, in North Korea uh, through which university students can communicate with each other, also, of course, under supervision. Uh, otherwise, the Internet is not much of a force. Um, but as I said, the information cordon has collapsed, and an awful lot of uh, DVDs and, and videos and things like that are coming into the country. But I don't think we should attribute too much importance to them. Uh, I talked to one woman once who was very excited about having seen a Mickey Mouse backpack in Pyongyang, 
Uh, and I said to her, you know, the, the Luftwaffe pilots in the Second World War flew into battle with Mickey Mouse painted on their fuselages. My point is that because this is not a Marxist-Leninist regime, but a nationalist one, it's more impervious to heterodox uh, cultural influences like that. I know from my own youth uh, in South Africa that uh, my most racist classmates, the ones who wanted to put a fence around all the blacks and let them starve to death, were avid fans of reggae music and Bob Marley. Uh, and, and of course, you can be a racist and root for your NFL team, which is 95% black, and not see any contradiction in that. So I don't think that people should expect these DVDs, these smuggled products, uh, to bring about an enormous change in the way that people look at the rest of the world. The second most nationalist country in the world, in my view, is South Korea, which is completely open and completely wired, uh, and, and, and also and still dominated by a very paranoid way of looking at the outside world. Do you, uh, Brian, do you have a point of view on the outlook for the North Korean economy? Uh, for the North Korean economy, I'm not so sure. Um, uh, this recent currency reform, I'm not really sure what it was all about. I, I tend to think that reports of the opposition to that currency exchange, which took place last year, have been exaggerated a little bit uh, because the average North Korean did not have $3,000 under his pillow that he wanted to change anyway. And he was probably pretty happy to see these black market traders taken down a peg or two. Uh, my impression of it is that Kim Jong-il probably did not impoverish his own power base. I don't think any leader in his right mind would be crazy enough to do that. So I have to assume that the people uh, in the so-called core class in North Korea, the, the, the favored political class, that they knew this was coming and they were prepared for it, and that it was merely an effort to uh, impoverish the sort of people who had acquired wealth in, in unsanctioned ways. Mm. It's often referred, North Korea is referred to as the hermit kingdom. Um, do you look at the economy that way? And what I mean by that question is, is are they so cut, cut off from any kind of um, interchange, any kind of commerce, that it is almost a hermit economy? Or are yeah. the Chinese there? Are the South Koreans there? The Chinese are there, of course, and they are investing and, and extracting uh, North Korea's natural uh, wealth from the country. Uh, it is, I believe, a hermit economy. Um, I think I should turn off my computer. Hold on a second. I'm starting to make noise. Um, it is a hermit economy, but what I warn against is the common tendency to think that this is a country obsessed with self-reliance, and it's not. Mm. Um, North Korea has relied on outside aid ever since day one. I say it's more like a hikikomori state. I don't know if anybody knows what a hikikomori is. These are these Japanese youths that you read about in the newspaper who um, do not want to leave their rooms, so their mother basically has to come and leave the food in front of the door for them. Why? Because they feel that they can maintain their independence better by relying on their parents than by working together with people, than by actually going out into the marketplace. And North Korea is a kind of hikikomori state. It believes that it can maintain its independence better by relying on the outside world for aid than by working together with the outside world, which would mean trade and, and businessmen coming back and forth and all these other horrifying things to the regime. Mm. So it is still a hermit economy, but uh, Kim Jong-il knows he has to make some concessions. So what he does is he tries to open these special zones. He's trying to sort of seal off these areas uh, to make sure that they don't sort of seep into the, the country at large. And he realizes sporadically that that's not working out very well. So you have this kind of flip-flop. Yeah. Uh, it was once said that the relationship between uh, Kim jong Sung and the Kim Chinese, Il yeah, Kim Il Sung, thank you, and the Chinese was as close as lips to teeth. Yeah, that's just not true. But what uh, about today? What about the Chinese relationship? It was never true. Um, the the it, it's interesting to read the Chinese archives from the Korean War and to see what what a bad relationship there was between the Chinese and the North Koreans. For one thing, the Chinese were furious at the North Koreans because they kept shooting American prisoners. Uh, the Chinese actually had to raise their guns at the North Koreans to get them to back off. Uh, the, the North Koreans did not even want to give the Chinese control over their railroad, which the Chinese needed in order to transport their troops effectively. So my point is, if they couldn't work together well during the Korean War, when North Korea was relying on, on, on China for its very survival, how much less likely are the North Koreans to listen to the Chinese now when the North Koreans have, have nuclear weapons? Um, what I hear from, from sources in China is that they're pretty much exasperated with the North Koreans. Uh, they're tired of, of continuing to finance them, but they really don't see much of an alternative because they don't want the regime simply to collapse. Well, that might be a good segue into the uh, discussion about maybe the six-party talks, that outlook, and, and U.S. foreign policy. Um, um, 
Sheila Smith, who is a Council on Formulation senior fellow and has written extensively about the issues on the peninsula, has called this America's intractable problem, the North Koreans. So are we, um, you know, when looking to the Chinese to be the, the balance, the ballast, I guess, is the better word in that uh, effort at negotiation, which is now totally broken down. Is that a misplaced uh, ambition on the part of the U.S.? Yeah, it is. I, I've talked to people who, uh, to people who are uh, actually involved in that whole negotiation process, and they said basically the Chinese at these six party talks, they offer the milk and cookies, and they don't really do anything to, to, to push North Korea to negotiate in earnest. And I understand that because, as I said before, the Chinese can have no more success in that endeavor than we can. The North Koreans aren't stupid. They know just how disastrous it would be for them to disarm. Let's not forget just how much we're asking from North Korea anyway. I mean, Canada is not a warlike country, but if we were to say to the Canadians, if you cut your uh, military in half, we'll raise your standard of living by 10% over the next 10 years, I think we can imagine what they'd say to us. And uh, how much less likely is it then that the North Koreans are going to get rid of their last reason for, for, for remaining? Mm -hmm. So the six party talks, I think, just just founded on a completely wrong premise. And I don't believe that the North Koreans can be negotiating in good faith. One way that we could find out would be to say to them, okay, um, let's not worry about fancy nuclear timetables or anything. What we want to see from you is a show of good faith in your own propaganda. It's not going to cost you anything to tone down the anti-American propaganda for a couple of weeks. If you think, you know, we're not pulling our side of the bargain, you can go back to doing it. But let's just see if, if, if you're in good faith here. Because if you really do want to disarm, why are you telling your people that there can never be peace with the United States? Why are you telling your people that revenge will be wrought on the United States? So let's see you change some of those messages as a, as a show of good faith. That's something that I think we should be doing. We need to be going to the heart of the North Korean regime's problem, which is this pedestal that it really can't climb down from. Hmm. And that being the military pedestal that you described. Right, both the, the, the claim to power. Words. They need, before they can disarm, they need to be uh, deriving their political legitimacy from something else. Hmm. And we need to be able to see if they're doing that or not. In your knowledge about the North Koreans, what could that something else be? I really don't know, because I, don't, I really don't see where they can go. Um, without devolving into a third-rate or fourth-rate South Korea. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem. Many people in, in, in the United States tend to look at North Korea as if it were Libya. You know, Libya, as you know, got rid of its nuclear aspirations and, and decided to play nice with the United States. But there was no South Libya vying for legitimacy. Uh, Gaddafi remains the sole definer of what it means to be Libyan. So he had more leeway. Uh, North Korea, what can they do? You know, this is one of two Koreas that is trying to show that it has the sole exclusive right to rule the entire peninsula. And they can't simply admit to having made an enormous mistake. They can't, uh, you know, agree to, to be in an economy that is where the South Korean economy was in maybe 1975. So the box gets smaller and smaller. Right. The regime has pretty much painted itself ideologically into a corner. Mm -hmm. Uh, the U.S. has uh, a few troops in South Korea, and someone, a uh, member of the audience, asks, should we withdraw troops from South Korea, in your opinion? Well, if you talk to any, any expert on military strategy, they will say that it makes strategic sense to withdraw American troops from the peninsula, because then you'd be better able to respond to a North Korean provocation. The situation right now is that um, we're kind of held hostage because anything we would do against North Korea could well uh, incite the North Koreans uh, to attack Seoul. And they don't need nuclear weapons to flatten Seoul. They could do that with conventional weapons. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that were we to withdraw American troops, it would not only make us better able to respond militarily, it would also put the Kim Jong-il regime under enormous pressure to do all those things that so far he's accused the Americans of preventing namely unifying the peninsula, uh, improving the standard of living among his people. And of course he can't do that. And were we to pull American troops out, the North Koreans would very quickly realize that it wasn't the Yankees all along who were preventing uh, reunification. It was the South Korean people who didn't want it. Hmm. And that truth, I think, is going to really go to the heart of the personality cult. So this would be a hairy time because it would be a time in which you'd expect the North Koreans uh, to lash out and perhaps to try to reunify the country by military means. But I don't think it's anything that the, North, that the South Koreans can't, can't handle on their own. What do uh, Koreans north and south, or north or south, whatever point, think of the Japanese? Oof, well, in South Korea, 
Interestingly enough, uh, and this, this goes to the other point that I made about the cultural imports, since the ban on Japanese culture was lifted in South Korea by Kim Dae-jung, anti-Japanese sentiment has actually increased in South Korea. I remember being in South Korea in the mid-1980s and there was a, a, a wrestling match on TV um, between a Japanese man and I think it was an American athlete. And the people were rooting for the Japanese athlete. And uh, I asked my wife why and she said, um, well, because it's basically the same Asians, you know, we're rooting for the Asians over you white people. And um, that would be unthinkable now, you know, and that's how times have changed. Even though my Korean students, for example, are all listening to Japanese music and watching Japanese dramas. So this dislike of, of Japan has actually increased. Um, and in North Korea, of course, it's, they've always been sort of the race enemy number two um, to, to uh, the United States. Uh, there is a question about uh, Robert Park, the uh, uh, Christian activist who was released recently by the North Koreans. Uh, what are your thoughts on his comments and uh, yeah. that uh, episode? Well, you know, the, the poor guy. I mean, I read about him crossing the border saying, I'm an American. Um, and the last thing you want to do as, as, as an ethnic Korean in North Korea is say, I'm an American. Um, that to them is just, is just uh, baffling. And the reports I heard was that he'd been severely uh, beaten while in, in North Korean custody. Um, I don't think that these, these kinds of things are particularly helpful myself. I don't really understand what he set out to gain. I'm sure his heart was in the right place. But uh, what you're doing there is basically putting the U.S. State Department under pressure to try to get you out, which they have to do by making certain concessions to the North Koreans. So if you're doing that in order to try bringing the regime down, I think you're having the, the opposite effect. Mm, but do you think it was a bit of an olive branch on the part of the North? To let him go? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I just don't think they really wanted to keep him there. Uh, more uh, trouble? Yeah, just more trouble. And, and this is why, of course, they didn't want to put those two journalists in, in jail last year either. The last thing they want is, is a foreigner or an outsider getting a look at how they treat their prisoners. Mm. So they were probably perfectly happy to let him go in response for, for something. Yeah. Well, we're coming very close to, to winding up. And a, a question here asks about the name Kim Il Jong. Kim Jong Il. Kim Jong Il. I apologize. I always okay. turn those around. Um, can you give us some uh, understanding? It's, it's Kim Il Sung's name basically become is, is can be translated as becoming the sun, and Kim Jong Il's name can be translated as 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 the true sun. Perhaps these names um, are not particularly symbolic though for the for the North Korean people because they've stopped using Chinese characters uh, in their writing. Uh, so I wouldn't read too much into those names. It's a bit like etymology in, in English as well. You know, we, you can look at the etymology of certain words, but we're not really conscious of them uh, in daily life. Uh, the interesting thing, of course, is that in Korean families, often um, the names of the sons will all be quite similar. So the first Chinese character of of the children's first names will all be the same one. Mm. And this is why uh, those pictures that I showed you, the three sons, you have Kim Jong Nam, Kim Jong Chol, and Kim Jong Un. Those are all mm. quite similar names. And what about the daughters? The daughters, I'm, their, their names are different. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do they, they take of course, the mother's name? Uh, they can take any name. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, that's not uh, set or anything. Uh, we don't know anything about these kids. Um, and and I, I just don't really understand this, this Western obsession with who, which one of those kids it's going to be. We knew that Kim Jong-il was going to take over for about 15 years, mm -hmm. and we were still taken completely by surprise by him. We, if you remember back in the mid-1990s, we all thought he was some sort of semi-retarded playboy <laughs> who wasn't going to be, those were the, I mean, they, they, they talked about him with, as if he was retarded. They, they, they raised that possibility and nobody expected North Korea to keep going. That's why we signed that agreed framework in 1994. We didn't expect the country to survive long enough uh, for that framework to be a problem for us. And we were still unprepared. So my point is that instead of focusing on who it's going to be and speculating about that, we should focus instead on the ideology which all of those kids probably have in common. So, unfortunately, Brian, we are out of time, but allow me to say thank you to the World Affairs Council, to Books, Inc., and the Asia Society of Northern California, and to Mr. Myers for his expansive talks about this part of the world that uh, has many of us mystified. Um, I encourage you all to take advantage of the book signing table next to uh, this table up here, and uh, have a pleasant evening. Drive home safely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
B.R. Myers, a contributing editor at the Atlantic Monthly, currently teaches North Korean literature in South Korea. He's the author of A Reader's Manifesto, an attack on the growing pretentiousness in American literary prose. For more information, visit mhpbooks.com.